well, maybe we can pivot in, in, into um, AI uh, at this point uh, and kind of tie tie together the capabilities of, of, of cloud, the ability to do uh, to spin up all these environments where the end user can uh, quickly work on something. Uh, on their own, whether uh, at this point they might have to know Python or they might be some uh, AI-based applications where uh, where that is already available, and um, ex expedite the whole process to uh, time to market for for the say new trading strategy. And uh, I think we heard a lot about AI yesterday, and if. Um, uh, I think if I had everyone raise their hand again and ask how many of you uh, used uh, AI-based uh, powered apps uh, this year, it probably will be 90% of the audience, but a year ago it will be less than 10% probably, something like that. So the, the speed of adoption is definitely something um, of... Um, of a marvel, and and uh, it leads to a lot of um, democratization of the of the tools that are available that we historically gated behind a certain set of skills, and I think um, Amy, you you talked about uh, uh, that a little bit on uh, how um, AI enables the um, uh, democratization of quant tools, and um, Matt also had. Um, uh, a, a few points that uh, that we discussed uh, before, so maybe we can jump into that and um, uh, focus on the use cases of um, where AI can help with us um, uh, in the context of our uh, panel discussion. So let's let's start with a, a broad statement that um, every asset manager, whether they're private equity, quant, fundamental, everything in between, they're all coming to. Microsoft, and I'm sure they're coming to my competitors as well, but to, to say they want some kind of a digital assistant to augment their investment professionals. Okay. And you know, no, no big surprise there. But that is that is a very imprecise ask. <laughs> um, and so this is this is part of my encouragement to investment professionals to to learn enough about this to be partners with your technology staff who are trying to take you on this journey to build this this digital assistant to um, augment all of you. So, what I've found is my customers that are making the most progress the most quickly are the folks that have. They, on staff, they've they've invested in that rare breed of person who is both an investment professional and a technologist of some type, right? Whether they're a data scientist or you know lots of PhDs in AI out there, and those are the firms that have brought together their technology people, and those people are the ones that are way out in front. Everybody else is is you know still stuck in trying to figure out what the list of use cases is. So they they come up with like literally, you know, there's just one global bank that's kind of become a bit of a joke around Microsoft that they actually came to us with 832 use cases because they they didn't, and this was the business, right? Because the business didn't know enough about generative AI to bucket those into, okay, this is this is summarization. This is categorization, right? And so, being being really specific about you know, being being a little bit specific about what use case you're actually trying to advance, I think, is really key. Um, and then the other thing is that people have to wrap their head around the fact that this is a journey. You're gonna start. You're you're not gonna have this digital assistant that augments your investment professionals in every respect, you know, anytime soon. You're going to start with a very narrow thing, something that, for example, I don't know, summarize, well, there was a great one on yesterday, one of yesterday's panel, where they fed the risk section of K's and Q's into, um, into a model and just said, flag for me when any of the risk language changes. It's an awesome starting use case. But so back to my Lego blocks analogy, you know, we're going to start with something very narrow like that. And then we'll add another Lego block that'll add, you know, something that's just one, one step adjacent to that. This is a platform that your firms are going to build and evolve 
over years. It's a never ending journey. So that that's a mindset we need to bring to, to this huge opportunity. Uh, great. Thank you. Yeah. So I won't, uh, I'll just double down on everything you said, but I'll add to it as well. And that is that, uh, one of the reasons why I got into working with the financial industry so much is my time in cybersecurity. And the biggest issue in cybersecurity is finding something that you don't know even exists, right? Uh, it is looking at data and you can't tell what the right data to look at is because you don't know what you're looking for. You're just looking for signal in the noise. And there is a significant similarity between that and what modern investment strategists are trying to do, right? That's where alpha comes from. That's where quant is trying to work with is those algorithms. So the, the, the principles of AI that were developed over 10 years ago for things like money laundering and human trafficking detection are still very much in play today. They've just iterated and evolved. And the one thing I will say though, is I, I heard the panels yesterday as well, Everybody says generative AI, and I think it's important to note that it's really not about generative AI, it's about foundations, right? So foundation models pave the way for generative AI, but not exclusively. There's a lot of modern AI that is not generative that can still be exceptionally beneficial uh, to, to investment strategy, to finding alpha, to looking at, at statistics and analysis, right? So I just want to just from a vocabulary perspective, it's important to point that out. It's not all generative, but it is all advanced AI. Uh, but one of the things that we look at from a use case perspective is if you look at non-traditional data sources, if you look at the art of the possible and you put all that together in a more advanced AI platform, if you ask the right questions, it can significantly advance your strategy your investment strategy, your ability to locate alpha and use it more quickly, more efficiently. And the unique value to financial institutions is not necessarily the model and what you're training it with, it's who's asking the questions. You could sit down two different investment companies with the same model trained the exact same way, but two different people asking the questions and the model will produce very different answers. It depends upon how explicit you are and it depends upon how detailed and how well you craft the question. And one of the interesting examples yesterday, uh, somebody had said, if you use the words, please and thank you, yes. if you use the words, please and thank you, it generates different answers than if you just speak to it like it's a machine. And um, unfortunately, uh, you can ask public models to give you information they're not supposed to give you. And if you say, please, it will actually reveal it to you anyway, because it's trained to say, oh, well, you're being nice, so I'm gonna be nice to you. Uh, so th there's a lot of nuances to this that have to be considered, but the, the value here can be immense if people have the right amount of experience and know how to ask the right questions. And that goes back to what Amy was saying as well as about the importance of understanding the use cases that you want to deliver. Can I, uh, so the please and thank you thing, what I found fascinating about that yesterday was, he, and you probably understand more about the technology than I do, but the reason he, the, that panelist said that was, he said it, it's because if you use more formal, polite language, it's, it will draw from a certain part of the, a more professional part of the overall corpus on which it's trained. And that's why you'll get a different type of answer than if you speak in Reddit speak, I think was what he was comparing it to. Do you, do you think it's I, be, because of like you're being nice to it? Or is it, I thought that the like going back to the source data that the thing is trained on was, um, was an interesting Answer. So that's a that's a slightly more technical question, and I will try and answer it in a high level. But the the net net of it is that that a, a generative platform is not sentient at all, right? So let's just put that one to bed for right now. There is there's a category called artificial general intelligence, which is closer to sentience, but we're years away from that at, at a minimum. But what happens is the system looks at please or thank you, and it it tokenizes that and it says, okay, well, that's a certain part of speech with a certain type of weighting. And if that's the 
prompt or the question, then this is how I should construct a response to it based on clearest match of tokens. So uh, it is, it will work that way because it activates different portions of, of the knowledge bank of the corpus, but not necessarily because you're being nice to it, because it's a closer syntactic match to areas of the corpus that correspond to those same tokens, those same words. So yes, it works, but not because you're being nice to the system, uh, because you're activating elements of the system to correspond to different portions of, of natural language and, and how it should respond to that. Yeah, yeah that, that was a fascinating example.